So um, today we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Cynthia Kolar-Tem, who is a program coordinator for the Invasive Species and Wildlife Disease Ecosystems Mission Area at the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and Dr. Tam's uh, research is mostly in the area of ecosystem stressors on global, global processes, and uh, she's well known for her, her work in the Great Lakes and Mississippi area on the same topic. Um, the title of today's presentation is Nexus of Natural Resource Management, Policy, and Invasive Species Science. So please welcome Dr. Tam. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation and, you know, would have preferred to be there in person, but, but this will just have to do. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Let's see this one. Okay. All right. So did that all work? <laughs> yeah, I can see it. So I okay. think it's all working. Terrific. Um, so I manage a national research program for the federal government. And I'm going to give an overview of some of the research that we have going on that I think is super cool, um, but different than probably most of the, the seminars that, that you hear um, for this sort of thing. This is not my research. This is research that is um, funded through the program that I coordinate. So that's one difference. And the second difference is um, I'm just as much, you know, I'm excited to tell you about the research, but I'm also making a plug for my whole profession. Uh, I graduated from three universities and I didn't really know that science administration was a, a profession. And I find it super fun and challenging and maybe someone out there would as well. So um, that's as much as, as what I'm gonna talk about as well. The title was getting kind of unwieldy already, um, but the program that I manage is invasive species and also wildlife disease. So I'll be talking about that as well. So invasive species, I think probably most people know, have an idea of what invasive species are. Um, there was an adjustment to the definition that we use in the federal government in an executive order that was signed by Obama in 2016. Um, but it's in any given ecosystem, species that come from outside that ecosystem that are caused or are likely to cause harm. Now, likely is something that was added. And this means economic or uh, uh, environmental harm and includes health as well. So human health, animal health, and, and plant health. Um, it's a more inclusive definition than was used before in the federal government. An example of this uh, are the Indo-Pacific lionfish. I believe there's two species that are found um, well, now throughout the Caribbean and the Gulf and, and up the East Coast as well. Um, this is a screen grab from a USGS database called the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. And probably some of you know, lionfish are kind of everywhere and take over reefs and are very hungry little things. Um, so uh, what about wildlife disease? Um, about 60% of emerging infectious diseases in humans are zoonotic in that they're shared between animals and people. And most of those, 70% of those, um, come from wildlife species. So, um, and the, so these are diseases like um, West Nile virus, avian influenza, um, plague, and well, this year, uh, SARS-CoV-2 that, that causes COVID-19. Um, all um, have reservoirs or came from uh, wildlife species. So invasive species and wildlife disease are large threats to the United States, cost billions and billions of dollars each year. Invasive species alone cost more for, uh, to prevent and control in the United States than all natural disasters in any given year. So it's an expensive and um, costly uh, to, to health and ecology as well, problems in the United States. So because they're so costly, we try to attack these problems as early on this invasion curve as we can. So if we can prevent um, invasive species and disease from getting here, yeah, that's, that's the way to go. There's a window for eradication when numbers are low and they're, they're not firmly estab established yet. Um, after they become established, there's a period that containment may be possible uh, when we have the tools to do that. And then as a last resort, the best thing 
first, uh, for a lot of cases, the best we can hope for is long-term management. So to set some management objectives and work on tools to um, reduce impacts. And so since we concentrate on, on the beginning stages of the invasion curve, um, that, that area of the curve, um, we kind of term biosurveillance, where we're doing actionable science that leads to actionable outcomes. Um, and this, a, a recent term that we're using is actionable intelligence. So there, there's more on this slide than, than I actually needed. But uh, biosurveillance, we're looking at um, letting folks know what they need to care about in their, the realm that they are managing or, or that they are um, concerned about, a state, a watershed, or whatever the case is. So we're looking at risk prediction and forecasting. What species could be coming your way? Um, um, global horizon scans or, or state horizon scans, that sort of thing. Um, once um, you understand what, be, what might be coming your way, there's monitoring and detection becomes really important to catch something early in the invasion process. Then we look to provide situational awareness, and that could be just maps of likely spread, or it could include some decision science analysis for how resources might best um, address this emerging problem. And then consequence management, which really gets more into, into the decision science realm. Um, what threshold might um, cause uh, either, uh, say, response action? When do you go out and, and do something about something that you find? So for the rest of the talk today, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my career path, how I got to where I am, and talk about what is science administration, what I do, and then I'll give that overview on some of the neat stuff that we're doing in USGS. So, long time ago now, uh, the late 80s, uh, I received my bachelor's at Michigan State University. I went out to Wyoming and got my master's, and it was looking at um, the behavior of invertebrates. Uh, oh, I had one of those. And then I moved uh, to back to Michigan, and I was a technician for the Fish and Wildlife Service, where I did um, cruises out on the Great Lakes to study native and non-native fishes. After that, I went uh, to work for the state of Illinois, and I managed a research facility um, where we did research to inform uh, stocking of fish around the state of Illinois. I also studied an exotic zooplankton, Daphne Limpolsi, and had this one, and some of you might know this one. This is Sophie Jorgensen, um, who's a PhD candidate there. And I went back to school, University of Notre Dame, got my PhD. Um, I was a fisheries person and I was looking at characteristics of, of invasive species. And I did a, a big literature review and ended up, wasn't about fish, it ended up being about plants and birds. Um, that study was, was cited a lot, that appeared in tree and it's been cited almost 3000 times now. Um, I contributed to a book chapter and did a risk assessment to predict potential fishes in the Great Lakes. Um, and that one also ended up being uh, cited a bunch of times. After that, I went and became a research biologist for the U.S. Geological Survey in um, Wisconsin there. And my job, I was twofold, had two parts to it. I helped to manage sea lamprey, come up with ways to control sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. And then also I was tasked with developing a research program on aquatic invasive species in the upper Mississippi. And it was clear that the species to be concerned about at that time was, was the Asian carp species. When I was there, I also um, was what, part of a, a collaborative effort to, to write a book on, um, on some of the biology and ecology and, and risks associated with big head and silver carp. And that, I think I concluded that in 2005, I think is, when we moved over and I moved to headquarters. And so that was the, the end of my research career. Um, from that point, so I, I published well, but then I switched over to administration. And I think having that science background really helped. Um, it helps me um, be able to help determine research priorities now as, as a program manager, and also gives me credibility with our scientists and with our partners. Uh, for my job, I only need to have a bachelor's. I don't need to have these advanced degrees, um, but I think that they really did help. So after moving to headquarters, 
um, I moved up the ranks a little bit and had been managing, managing the program um, for several years. We added wildlife disease a couple of years ago. Uh, so what do I like about this? Well, the science that I was interested in doing and that, that some of it that I completed uh, throughout my career was really, I, I was looking to improve and inform natural resource management and policy. Um, and you know, there's, there's give and play uh, in both of these cases. For uh, natural resource management, we were looking for ways to prevent, contain, and control invasive species and wildlife disease now. And with policy, it's sometimes we're informing legislation, we're helping um, agencies that need to make regulations, and working with industries and others to develop best management practices to reduce risk. And when you manage science at a national level, at a regional level, you're right in the middle of all of that. And so you get to affect science priorities that are going to contribute to making better decisions in natural resource management and um, to um, improve the ability to, to regulate when necessary and to uh, help when it isn't uh, in developing best management practices. So um, this is about USGS. So stepping back a little bit, um, the US Geological Survey is pretty much the science branch of the Department of the Interior. And USGS is divided into um, some mission areas on, on the left-hand side of the slide there. I, we're changing a little bit now. We're always, it's the government, we're always kind of changing a little bit. Um, but the top box there is ecosystems. And the program that I manage falls within the ecosystems mission area. But um, USGS does a lot of other science. We do um, look at climate and land use changes, uh, energy and minerals, environmental health, natural hazards like volcanoes and earthquakes, and um, water availability and quality around the country. The program that I manage, as I said, falls within the ecosystems mission area. In the ecosystems mission area, we provide science to improve species management. This is uh, fish and wildlife species. We um, provide science for land and water management, and then also in biological threats. Also part of the ecosystems mission area are the cooperative research units that are at universities across the country. And um, we recently moved over environmental health. So moving to what you do as a, a program, as a science administrator. And this makes it seem pretty easy. This, this is part of what I do. This is probably the heart of what I have to do all of the time. Um, and it, and it, uh, we're, it's, it's, it's a cycle. You have to be around for a couple of years before you get all the way around this loop, I would say. Um, but what you do as a science administrator is a bunch of communication. It's, it's a bunch of collecting information from the field, moving that up through my bureau leadership, USGS leadership, over to DOI, and then up either to Congress or um, offices of the administration of the president, like um, the Office of Management and Budget or the Council on Environmental Quality. Um, and you also talk to congressionals. So um, what I am is an information desk. Um, I bring the information up, but then also move it down to, to our science centers and our scientists as well. Um, so, and it also, you really have to understand what all the priorities of the different partners are and how that fits in with what Congress is looking for or and also making sure to keep the science new and fresh and that we're on the cutting edge. Um, so there's there's um, there's there's a lot to do. <laughs> um, so as part of this, as an example, uh, each year Congress passes a budget. And uh, the here we are at the end of September and we're hoping that they give us something a budget or a um, continuing resolution so that we can show up to work on October 1st. Um, but eventually we'll get a, a budget from Congress and that goes to the, at, well, there's all kinds of staff, but it ends up at the USGS and it comes to um, my program, programs. And that we allocate the money out to the science centers. And most of that money we give directly to the science centers and they work with their regional partners to figure out their, what needs to be done. Uh, some of the money I hold back and I make sure that we allocate that toward national priorities. 
And in uh, Ecosystems Mission Area, we are across the country at a bunch of um, centers and field stations and cooperative research units. Uh, the color-coded things are uh, dots and whatnot, <laughs> targety things, are um, our science centers and um, field stations. The flags represent the, the CRUs. You can see there's, there's one down there in Baton Rouge. Uh, we have the, um, a cooperative fish and, wild, fish and wildlife unit um, at LSU. So then that's where the science actually happens. And we have um, scientists across the country who work on invasive species and wildlife disease. And they do their stuff and they, they put out their products and, and I look for opportunities to, um, to promote that work and to um, affect, to, to get the, our results to um, governmental leaders where um, we can help get some things implemented is, is what we try to do. As part of our, our function in headquarters, we do performance reporting. So we let um, our director and DOI and Congress and anyone else who asks what we did with the money. Um, this is taxpayers' money and we need to show that we are doing um, good work, that we're spending it well, and that we're also addressing priorities that Congress told us to when they give us increases and demonstrate that we um, stop work in areas that they decrease our funding in. And the last part of this, this one cycle is the budget development. And so at any given time, we have three budget cycles that we're working on. So right now we're in, um, we're working on finishing up 2020. Uh, we're waiting on Congress for 2021. And we just about have 2022 um, planned. So, um, so there are questions all along the way um, from, you know, within the administration or, or, or from Congress. And so there, there's a bunch of, of questions that need to be added, asked all the time. So um, what sort of species do we work on? Uh, the invasive species program covers fish, I'm sorry, co covers terrestrial and aquatic plants and animals. We do a little bit of marine work, but not that much. Some of the reptiles that we work on are um, Burmese pythons in South Florida, black and white, this is the Argentine black and white tegu, in Florida and Georgia, and I'm not sure where all, where all else at this point, and brown tree snakes on Guam. Uh, some of the aquatic species we work on, um, Congress has made invasive carps, big head, silver, grass, and black carps um, a major priority for us. Um, that's over the past 10 years. Um, these carps are throughout the Mississippi River Basin, um, including down near you, and it's a big threat to the Great Lakes. And in the past, it's been that threat to the Great Lakes that has brought uh, money to the problem. But recently, um, the, the Southeast has um, gained some, um, I don't know, maybe political attention, and uh, but we've had additional money to address the Southeast. We do a lot of work on invasive terrestrial plants, such as buffalo grass out west, Salt cedar, uh, which is tamarisk, which is kind of like along the Colorado River primarily, and common reed, which is Phragmites um, strain that is probably the biggest problem in the upper Midwest. We do a lot of work on wildlife diseases such as avian influenza, um, sylvatic plague, white nose syndrome, um, chronic wasting disease, uh, what else? And this year we've started doing some work with SARS-CoV-2 as well. So some of the sorts of research that we do. Um, I said that we try to concentrate um, on early in the invasion sequence um, in the biosurveillance realm. And part of that is providing information and data on um, where there are sightings of invasive species and wildlife disease and where they might be going. And so this is an example of something that we've been working on for the past few years. Um, it's called the Invasive Species Habitat Tool in Habit. And um, this is just a couple of screen grabs from that, um, that tool that's come up recently. And so uh, this started, we did this for the National Park Service. And um, this is looking at model agreements, agreement on the presence of suitable habitat for a variety of, of uh, plants. So this is just picking one plant and, and looking at where there's, there's agreement at a bunch of, 
of different models where the species might be. And so this, this was asked for by the, the Park Service, as I said, to inform their monitoring program so they can know where to look for individual plant species um, to get them early in the invasion before they become a problem. Um, something that we did to help inform policy. Um, oh, so there's this, there's this <laughs> a fungus uh, that has a very long B genus with a, a long um, S species uh, that's called B-cell that um, has been spreading in Europe and decimating salamanders there. So there's a lot of concern about B-cell coming to the United States where we have, we are the, the hotspot for uh, salamander biodiversity. And uh, so Fish and Wildlife, I'm sorry, so uh, USGS scientists across the country got together to develop this um, a risk assessment to identify, you know, like using suitable habitat and the number of salamander species and some uh, other um, climatic variables to develop this heat map where the, the greatest risk to salamanders from B-cell would be. And this, this, the risk assessment that was produced um, was completed in 2016 helped Fish and Wildlife Service develop an interim rule to regulate the importation of salamanders. And actually they've um, restricted the importation of 100, 201 species of salamanders um, to protect the country from, um, from B-cell. And uh, we recently completed another, a, a round of sampling across the country to, uh, to see, to make sure that, that B-cell wasn't detected. Um, something else we do to provide some information um, about potential threats is uh, this is a tool that was added to the non-indigenous aquatic species database that I mentioned earlier and had the, the map of uh, uh, lionfish. Um, this is something that we added a couple of years ago called the, the flood and storm tracker. So when a hurricane comes through and you've got uh, water levels rising, watersheds are temporarily connected during that connection time it is an opportunity for the spread of invasive species. And so um, after a big hurricane comes through or a big flood, this, this map I grabbed from 2019, the Midwest flood, you know, the Mississippi River came up um, and I picked uh, zebra mussels for this. And you can see where, um, uh, where zebra mussels are presently or the light green. And during the, the time where there was the flood, um, the, the watersheds in dark green were connected. And so those would be a good area, those are good areas for um, um, governmental agencies and universities to go out and look for um, the spread of zebra mussels in this case. And we have um, a good number of agencies that, that use these maps to, um, to inform their after storm cleanup and to, to look for um, potential problems. Okay, so, um, so after you identify a potential problem, it's important to be able to go out and detect, to find these things early in the invasion. Um, we've been working a lot on um, uh, some molecular tools, particularly environmental DNA, um, to find invasive species early in the invasion. Some, there's a couple of the species that we've worked on. We've uh, looked at Burmese python and a, a bunch on the Asian carp species. Um, we do not, we, we look, we are looking to improve eDNA, the power of eDNA. So beyond presence and absence, but what, you know, what does, what is a false negative? What is a false positive? How do you, how do you interpret a, a positive finding? Um, you know, what, what is a threshold that might um, just because you find one positive, that doesn't mean that there's an established population or that the species is even there necessarily. So, you know, under, putting that into context so that it is information that a management or regulatory agency can use. So we're doing, we're doing a lot of that sort of thing and um, um, correlating, looking at relationship between number of copies of DNA and the abundance of the plant and animals in the environment. I'm also moving eDNA from the laboratory to the field with lamp assays where um, you can get an answer as to whether the DNA was present in a sample um, within an hour or so, which, which can be helpful for law enforcement and for um, very um, difficult to get to locations. Uh, one uh, example where we use eDNA is for rapid ohia death on, in Hawaii, which is a fungus that kills a very important forest species ohia in Hawaii. 
and some of the locations where they are can be difficult to uh, get to. And if you just take a plug of a wood sample from the tree and you go back to the lab and you find out that that tree was infected, then you have to go back, you know, it can take a long time to get to that tree to um, what they're doing is, is calling, cutting the trees down. So instead they take some samples from trees and, and wait for the analysis, uh, the results before they go back to their office. Um, so in addition to molecular tools, we're using more remote sensing tools. Um, such as buff, uh, drones. Uh, buffalo grass is a species that is found in a difficult terrain out west, and there's been really good response for, for catching buffalo grass really early in invasion. So we're using drones to, to identify those incipient populations. Um, and also tools like infrared. So tamarisk is a species that is uh, found in riparian areas around the Colorado River and a beetle, a biocontrol beetle was released a while back. And uh, we use um, cover, leaf cover, you know, the amount of green on leaves to uh, assess how well the, the, the beetle is controlling uh, tamarisk. We also look for tools like, uh, this is black light, looking for white nose syndrome um, on bat wings. So, um, something that we're looking to, um, well, we're, we're assessing the possibility of adding eDNA sampling technology throughout the nation as part of the USGS stream gauge system. So there's over 10,000 stream gauges that USGS maintains across the country. And um, uh, technicians go out there every one, to all the stations, all the gauging um, stations throughout the country. Uh, at some periodicity to, for maintenance and for, to download data. So um, there's a possibility of, of taking samples that we could process for eDNA. Um, we've also looked at um, automatic sample, sampling for eDNA and the two pictures on the right show installing a, like a robotic eDNA sampling system, which could work when you really care, which could be we found that you know, it does work actually, <laughs> but it could be especially helpful for when you wanna take samples throughout a 24 hour period or um, a location is very remote and difficult to get to. And, and so um, uh, taking samples remotely could be very helpful. Um, so after, so this is particular to the, the wildlife disease aspect of, of the program, um, but um, under, after you've detected something, understanding what disease that you have, you know, what was the cause of death um, in, a, in a wildlife die-off is something that um, USGS is very involved in. The National Wildlife Health Center is part of USGS and is in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, the health center has been, their, their, their job is to be surveilling wildlife for disease and um, uh, for example, right now there's a lot of bird die-offs that's happening in um, New Mexico in particular, and some of those birds are, are been sent to the National Wildlife Health Center to figure out cause of death. Um, so uh, going back to the biosurveillance, that, that continuum there, uh, situational awareness. So turning data into information is um, kind of a lot of, of the situational awareness side of things. Going back to the a non-indigenous aquatic species database. Um, this is the sort of information just about um, that you can get when you uh, go in to do a, uh, I think this was a text search that I did on big head carp. And this shows where observations have been. Um, something that we've added recently is this alert risk mapper. So when you go into the system, you can register as uh, for alerts and you can look, you can be alerted to species that come into a, a basin or a state that you care about, or you can um, follow particular species. And so when there is a new observation of that species, these maps are sent out for um, situational awareness. And you can see the star in the middle of this map um, shows where this observation occurred that was new. It was outside of a, of a um, watershed that is known to be infested with big head carp. And, um, the risk mapper shows watersheds that are at risk of spread given the new sighting. 
Um, and so this has been helping partners as well um, understand um, what new observations might mean to them. So that was on the aquatic invasive species side. And this is a kind of a, a little bit of an analogous system that we have for um, wildlife health. And so this is the Wildlife Health Information Sharing Partnership. And you can register as a user on there and you can um, follow uh, die offs <laughs> of um, wildlife diseases. So right now, um, there are, I, this was a, a, a current, uh, a common sort of disease that, that people are following. When I went in, you can, you can look to see what, uh, what's trending. And so this is um, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, and it, it's really decimating rabbits right now into, in, the south, in the Southwest. And I know that it poses a risk to rabbits, a variety of rabbit species. I think all of them in the United States. Um, so this is something that people are watching. And so in this system, you can look to see, um, you can follow individual species or individual diseases, and you can see uh, what these die-off events are, how many animals died, and um, uh, for situational awareness so that managers can understand um, what sort of threat is coming their way and how they might react. And this is a, a complicated example of situational awareness that we've been working on, um, avian influenza. So avian influenza, um, different strains generally come out of China. Our birds that we have in the United States, a lot of them, um, migrate from China through Alaska and down into the contiguous states. And um, some, if, if those birds are carrying um, strains of avian influenza, they're called high path, high path, highly pathogenic um, AI strains. Um, and it's, they're highly pathogenic, not to people, but to um, birds. So this is looking at kind of food security for the United States and, and economic impacts where we're look, overlapping where um, wild birds would be migrating and the location of our um, poultry, um, poultry agriculture, so where are agricultural farms that could be um, impacted? And this, it's a really big deal because if there's one farm um, that is infected with um, high path avian influenza in a state, um, agricultural products, poultry agricultural products from that state cannot be in international trade. So that it, it's a great big deal and it's something that um, that we are continually looking to improve. And uh, there's a couple of papers here that, that, were, um, that were published. And this, it's where we're looking at the strains that are coming out of, of China. And so there's a lot of telemetry data, a lot of tagging data that, um, that, is, that is involved in the study. So it's a very big study. Okay. Okay, so what do we do about control? And so this, it, we've kind of like crossed over from biosurveillance to kind of like the everything else. And USGS does a lot of this research. Um, we've, we have, I would say, especially developed, are known for um, controlling aquatic invasive species. Um, but this is some of the other work that we're involved in. Um, aerial baiting, this is a picture from Guam. Um, Brown tree snakes have been on Guam for decades now, and they led to the extirpation of essentially all, I think there's two native birds that still remain um, on the island, uh, mostly in captivity at this point, um, but they, they really eradicated birds and lizards uh, from the island. And so there's been a, a lot of developing of controls through time. And right now the um, USDA has a technology that could result in landscape control of brown tree snake in, in future years. And it re, it's with aerial dropping of baits that kill snakes. Um, found that Tylenol is very um, deadly to brown tree snakes. And so they actually drop mice, um, baby mice, the pinkies um, that are um, that have a Tylenol in them, and that will kill the snakes. So they've been working on that. Um, we also do, um, this is uh, pythons in the upper right here, uh, 
female pythons are remain on their nest throughout the winter. And so um, locating nests can be a way to um, remove those eggs. We also look for traps for reptiles as well. And we also develop traps and test them. Um, we also do, so this is looking at aquatic invasive species. Um, we do, we develop species specific controls, which is tough in aquatics. Um, so what, we're, what we've done here, this, this is a, actually a picture that depicts developing a vaccine um, for, for a salmon species that's in aquaculture. But we take that, that same technology that is meant to protect the fish and kind of turn it upside down and um, look for ways to take a molecule that is inactive unless it comes in contact with the right species of fish and where it becomes active and um, is lethal. And so we've been working on species specific control using similar technology um, for big head silver and grass carp and, and we're working on black carp right now. Um, so what we've done is come up with a formulation of a general piscicide. Um, antimyosin A is a, a general piscicide, but because of the way that the molecule has been packaged and the, the size that, that, um, that we're delivering it at, we can have, um, we are delivering species specific control. That's, it's pretty exciting. And uh, I don't know, there's, there's, it's been a long time really since there have been great advances in chemical control for aquatic invasive species. Um, we are also working on vaccines for wildlife to prevent them from getting diseases. Um, white nose syndrome, we're working on a, on a vaccine to control white nose where the vaccine is actually applied to the backs of bats and then they spread it to each other, the vaccine, um, through grooming. Um, they've also got a prairie dog there eating a little reddish square of vaccine and that's to protect it against um, plague, um, which can spread from, well, the, the primary concern, I mean, plague is probably something we really wanna control, um, but prairie dogs are prey for the black-footed ferret, which is highly endangered out West. And so um, these vaccines are, are actually being developed. The ultimate goal is to conserve the black-footed ferret. We also do um, some biotechnology sort of control for plants. This is um, some research I've been working on to control Phragmites, um, looking at gene splicing so that um, to interfere with um, photosynthesis. Also looking at microbial um, control because of a symbiotic effect that's needed for um, uh, Phragmites to take up nutrients. And then I've, I've got three slides here um, on our Asian, some of the Asian carp work that we've done. So Congress started giving us increases about uh, 10 years ago. And that's, and we had, so we've had steady funding for 10 years to address several species. And you can do big things with that. And so um, this is a very mature sort of research program. We've developed tools and now we're in the process of moving them to the field large scale. And so this is an example of an acoustic deterrent system. Um, it was found that underwater sound um, affects the distribution of Asian carp. They don't like sound under the water, particularly sounds like boat motors. And so we're looking at, this is adding an acoustic, we call it an ac acoustic deterrent system to, it's Lock and Dam 19 on the Mississippi River, which is between Iowa and Illinois. So this is something that we're working on right now and we hope to be, um, uh, installing over the winter. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, it's very, it, there's, this is very highly technical. We're working with the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, two states and a whole bunch of partners. So things are looking good. We hope to get this uh, out soon. Um, something, another tool that, that we've been working on as a deterrent, and a deterrent meaning that uh, the idea is Asian carp won't move further than the deterrent. Um, it's just to deter behavioral movement of the carp. So a second tool that we have is, is carbon dioxide. So we, we, sh we showed in the laboratory and then in mesocosms and in ponds that when you add carbon dioxide, you can affect the distribution of Asian carp. We did a, a large scale sort of demonstration of this 
This was more of looking at the engineering and the cost. Could we do this cost effectively? And um, they, we were able to come up with a system, the scientists working in the field came up with a system that, that didn't cost, was thought to be non-cost prohibitive um, and that it was feasible. And the picture up there on the top right is a congressional tour that went through um, to observe the, uh, the testing of this system. And then the last Asian carp example that I have, um, Asian carp are these great big fish. They become super abundant and really dominate the biomass in, in rivers and um, reservoirs. And so states are very interested in just removing them and creating a commercial fishery, enhancing a commercial fishery that, that might be present, um, but removing that, that biomass and that protein um, and looking for uses for that, uh, for those fish. So um, USGS has had a program, a research program in looking to improve commercial harvest. Um, one way that we've looked to do that is that picture on the bottom is adding an algal concentrate, which will bring fish in to feed. So you could bring, you can bring Asian carp to an area either to enhance removal or to um, perhaps reduce the amount of uh, toxicant that is used if, if we're gonna be doing um, chemical control. And so this, uh, we've been testing this, it's called the modified unified method, which comes out of China. Um, so our, a few of our scientists went over to China to learn how uh, Chinese are able to remove um, vast numbers uh, of Asian carp from very large bo bodies of water. So we're looking at how we can adapt that method to the US um, where we would have uh, fewer people involved and looking at greater mechanization. So that's something we've been working on for a few years. Um, and then because, again, because this is a mature research program, we've had dedicated funding for a, a good amount of dedicated funding for over a decade. Um, and we have lots of, of uh, federal and state partners working together to, to attack the Asian carp problem, um, we have a lot of data to integrate. And what, what you always hope to do when you're looking to control invasive species or wildlife disease is to integrate those technologies. You know, what, what tools are best to use on which life stages in which habitats um, to, to meet your management goal? Whether the management goal is to um, reduce impacts or to um, eradicate, if possible, or reduce below a, a threshold of impact that you define. And so what we're able to do now is to, to begin to have some more sophisticated sort of population models and look at, in different river stretches, what if you applied different control tools? Or where is the best place within a given river stretch to apply those tools? So we're, we're able to um, get some data visualizations right now um, and uh, to improve the, the quality and the amount of information that we can get out of some population modeling. And that's, that's where we are with that work right now. So that kind of goes through the whole um, invasive species and wildlife disease um, cycle where we do research, except for the rehabilitation. Um, the program that I manage does some of that work. Um, uh, we have other programs. We have one that provides science for land and water management, and some of, some of this work happens there. Some of this work also happens in uh, the species management program. Um, but we're always looking to, um, with this sort of work, to increase the resistance to future invasions and, and future infestations of pathogens. So that, that's pretty much what, the, what I wanted to cover in, in giving the, the overview. And again, I didn't do this research. Um, this is, is work that's going on by some, some pretty cool scientists around the country. Um, and if I could give a little bit of career advice, I would say find your passion, know your field, keep current and stay curious. Um, I had talked, when I was gonna be there in person, we had talked about me doing a workshop for how to apply for jobs in the federal government. And I guess that, that might be happening online in the future. So please look for that. That's all I had. Thank you very much. And I think we would all be looking forward to a seminar on that topic. <laughs> um, 
So we can open it up for questions right now. I already have one question, but anyone feel free to message me directly, whatever your question is, and I will just be reading the questions, basically introducing each one. So the, the first question that we have is, are there any new ideas for species specific control of lionfish? So I, I guess we're really asking, like, has anyone brought up some new ideas on this front? So I, I know there's a bunch of research. That's, so lionfish, I think, because it spread so quickly, and this is something, you know, like a marine fish that spread so quickly was kind of new. That's, we're used to that happening in terrestrial and freshwater environments. And I think lionfish just caught the, 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 the press and the imagination and some of the funding streams as well. And so I know of um, different organizations looking at specific traps and uh, you know, there's there's some kind of neat things out there where if it puts, you set a trap for lionfish and if it catches one, then it, it floats up with some kind of air bladder thing. Um, so I don't know of um, USGS isn't doing much research. And we we did a little bit on a trap early on, but I I don't think that we're doing anything. Um, and as far as I know, it's more trapping that I've heard. So I don't know too much about that. Okay. Um, do you, I guess in a similar vein, so it, snakehead is a major issue right now, yep. right? So are, are they going into similar initiatives for, for snakehead? Yeah, so there is a snakehead management plan, uh, national snakehead, snakehead management plan, and um, snakeheads, all species of the family, I believe, have been banned for importation into the country. Um, and up north and into the Midwest, it's, it's really the northern snakehead and down in Florida and I'm not sure where else, uh, it's really the, bulls, the bullseye snakehead that are, are causing the biggest problems. Um, so to get species specific control going, we really need to have um, uh, money. <laughs> and so right now, uh, snakehead haven't had that, uh, I don't know, unified governmental ire over the spread of snakehead. And so um, there were early attempts there. Gosh, those are tenacious fish. Um, I know of uh, an attempt to wrote known out to, you know, use chemicals to, to remove snakehead out of, this was Northern snakehead out of um, uh, watersheds in, I think it was a white river in Arkansas probably 12 years ago or so. And there was there was basically no water. <laughs> it was dewatered and there was like tiny little puddles of water under like root wads and there, you know, it'd be crammed full of snakehead. So I know that, you know, concern is growing. There was a uh, symposium not too long ago, a book came out on um, snakehead control. So I know that um, more people are getting concerned about it because they continue to spread. Um, I don't know of species specific control, but I do know of chemical control that's been going on and that wrote known has been used in the past for that. Okay. Um, we have another question here. It's um, when, an, when an invasive species range spans multiple states, is there a lot of coordination in policy slash management between those states? Yeah, so invasive species, so I, I said early, um, invasive species cost the United States at least, and I guess estimate is 20 years old, $120 billion a year. And my program that covers all taxa and all ecosystems, invasive species and wildlife disease, and I think I have $33 million this year. So I'm not going to, no one is, there's just not going to be any progress on something that costs $120 billion a year unless there's tons of coordination. And so uh, as an invasive species or wildlife disease issue emerges, yes, immediately working groups start being formed. And we look at, we generally start with what our authorities are. So for instance, USGS, we can't do research on private property, you know, unless we have agreements in place with, uh, with property owners. Other agencies can, you know, it depends on what their authorities are. So what we generally do when there's a, a new problem is a, a task force, a, a working group, something is formed. Everyone gets together and figures out what piece they bring to that puzzle and um, what resources we have to, to address it. You know, like um, some folks can 
get chemicals or nets or, or whatever is needed. And um, some of us, USGS, we, we are research. That's what we do. We don't manage anything. We don't regulate anything. So we have a very unique resource that we can bring. We're often support to folks, uh, other agencies and, and efforts that are out there doing control or um, you know, doing management. So tons and tons of coordination. And um, if you look, uh, invasive species stuff generally turns out to be regional. You know, um, uh, there'll be regional plans. So like zebra and quagga mussels, drycinid mussels are a problem getting to be kind of all over the country. But there is, there's a national management plan, but there's one specific for the West that has QZAP, I know is the, uh, the acronym that's used for that one. Um, because there's some like unique vectors and you know some unique things to that part of the country. And you'll find management plans like for the um, uh, greater Yellowstone watershed. Uh, there's a cooperative, a cooperative there that, that manages that. Um, that ecosystem. And so they have a, a management plan for that region. Same thing with the Everglades and the Great Lakes. And um, some of them are species specific. Um, Asian carp, there's a national Asian carp management plan. But then there's also some that are more um, uh, water, greater watershed um, specific as well. So tons of coordination, which is um, a challenge. It's a challenge and is something that we do out of headquarters. We help to facilitate that. Um, and then we have regional folks as well who are, and our, our um, principal investigators are, all of them practically are involved in some sort of regional or national coordination effort. Many are involved in many of them. So, so it's really spanning like not just many levels, but different kinds of organizations as well. Oh, for sure. For okay. Sure. Um, so another question. Um, is it ever realistic to think an invasive species will be completely under control? Do we have any success stories for management and removal of invasive species? Yeah, plenty, plenty. And those success stories are generally for when the infested area is smaller. So there's, um, uh, there's Island Conservation is an organization, uh, and a non-governmental organization that, um, you know, they, they, they took a look at where biodiversity is and where it's not being protected and they came on islands. Islands you know, have a lot of endemic species and are um, disproportionately affected by invasive species. So they have a goal of eliminating especially rodents that have been introduced onto islands to protect biodiversity. And there are lots of examples of individual islands where um, mice or rats and rats have been eradicated. So. Um, that's, and the federal government, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service in particular, um, assists with those efforts and then in monitoring for a long time after that. Um, so, and there's plenty of examples of, from fish, where fish were eradicated, um, again, from small areas. And, you know, what control looks like kind of depends on well, a whole bunch of things that aren't really scientific. It's very objective. You know, what's an impact that we want to live with? So it's like setting that, what is the threshold where we're calling an unacceptable um, impact? And how do we keep it below that? So we can meet all kinds of management objectives where it might be minimizing economic cost or, you know, not impacting, conserving a, a species or habitat that we um, value highly. And at the same time, not come close to eradication, you know. So it could be that um, um, some of our success stories are because we've been able to protect certain species or habitats while not eradicating. Um, and that that question of what is what what should we live with, you know? For instance, uh, there are invasive species and there are non-native species. So what is you know? should we be looking for a paradigm shift where maybe the ultimate goal is to reduce the, the coverage of a particularly high impact invasive species, even if it means we're replacing it with something that's non-native, but doesn't have those impacts. And so that, that's something that we, we think about. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> My husband got home. <laughs> um, 
so sometimes it's, it's looking at what control means and what we hope what we hope to achieve. So it's framing the question sometimes, um, but certainly eradication has been achieved um, lots and lots of times. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? Maybe one more. I have a question. It, it's a little bit general. Um, what extent do you think public opinion impacts the operations for USGS? Like, is it hard to drum up support for certain kinds of problems? It is. It is. And I, my, my program has the luxury of working with emergencies. They are very identifiable sort of problems. We do invasive species and wildlife disease. Those impacts are um, well, easier to document than, say, um, slower burning issues like um, fish passage. Um, and, and biodiversity and conservation, those, those are harder to, um, to have sustained funding for. Um, Congress is kind of, our money comes from Congress and um, Congress is designed to deal with problems. So it's, it's an unfortunate luxury that we have, that we, we have those in spades in my program. Um, so other parts of, uh, of ecosystems mission area have taken cuts through time. And meanwhile, um, the, our, the biological threats program have been increasing slowly. So it's a shift towards what Congress can more directly affect. You can bring home money to your constituents, you know, you can attack an, a, a problem. So, yeah. Okay, so I, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, we're all really thankful that, that you could make it for our Zoom seminar. And uh, hopefully we can see you in person sometime when this whole thing blows over. <laughs> That'd be great. Right. Thank you. Great, thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.